Continuum features rising talent from across the country along with related programming. Um, and it continues Textile Center's commitment to outstanding contemporary work being done in the field um, to support underrepresented communities uh, in the fiber arts. The range of work and practices unique to each artist addresses myriad ways that textile materials, processes, histories, and traditions continue to be used today to tell stories and share narratives about identities, both individual and community through the eyes and the hands of makers. So welcome to the first Art Speaks of 2022. Today's presentation and discussion focuses on the topic of family and memory, which is a recurring theme throughout the exhibition. Uh, ties to identity are rooted in family relationships and clearly embedded in memories made throughout a lifetime uh, in many of the works. Uh, in the exhibition. Now for the panelists. First, I'm going to introduce Ivan Yanez. Ivan, give you give everybody a wave. Uh, Ivan actually has uh, been helping me for the last month as program coordinator for the summer of programming activities around um, the Continuum exhibition, which has been really fabulous. Um, the exhibition and the programming are funded by a grant from the Minnesota State Arts Board, Creative Support for Organizations. And um, Yvonne will be presenting and moderating today. I can't thank her enough for her assistance so far this summer. It's been a pleasure to work with you. Yvonne is an interdisciplinary artist and fashion designer from Mexico City. Currently, she, st she is studying in the Master of Fine Arts program at the Minneapolis College of Arts and Design, where she's a graduate assistant in the arts entrepreneurship program and the class furniture, textile and surface. Her work has been exhibited at Fresh Eye Gallery, Gallery 148 and Gamut Gallery, all in Minneapolis from 2018 to 2020. Her work was focused in fashion media and retail design in Mexico City. She has a bachelor degree in fashion design from both the Universidad del Valle de Mexico in Mexico City and from the Nuova Academia del Bella Arte in Milan. Uh, presenting first today will be Jocelyn Suzuka Figueroa. Jocelyn, if you could give us a wave, everybody can see who you are. <laughs> Jocelyn is uh, also a Minneapolis-based HAPA artist. Um, shouldn't have said also there, but Jocelyn is a Minneapolis-based HAPA artist with a focus on fiber and painting. She was born in Kyoto, Japan. Uh, in 2015, she received her BFA from the Moore College of Art and Design and received her MFA from the Minneapolis College of Art and Design in 2021. Her work has been exhibited at the Rochester Art Center, the Suitcase Gallery in Minneapolis, Banfield Lock and Fridley, the Red Wing Art Center, and the Minneapolis Institute of Art. In 2021, she participated in the Wisher Residency in Park Rapids, Minnesota. Welcome, Jocelyn. Our next presenter will be Claire who? I know I said that wrong. Claire will correct us. Claire is an artist and weaver currently based in Brooklyn, New York. She completed her BFA with a focus in fiber and material studies at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago and has received additional training in textiles from the Jarrett Reitfield Academy in the Netherlands. Claire has shown widely in Chicago, Illinois at No Nation Gallery, Gallery No One, DFBRL8R, I don't know what that means. It's an acronym for something. And I'm sorry, in Sullivan Gallery. Recent exhibitions include the Textile Arts Center in Brooklyn, New York, and the Dream Clinic Project Space in Columbus, Ohio. She just completed a residency at Alfred University and is uh, a past Hambage Center Fellow and resident at the Textile Arts Center in Brooklyn. Uh, in 2022, she will also be a visiting artist at the Gibbs Museum of Art in uh, Charleston, South Carolina. And finally, we welcome Hala Akinci, who is joining us uh, today from Europe. She's a multidisciplinary Turkish artist, designer, and educator based now in Chicago. She received her MFA in Interdisciplinary Arts and Media at Columbia College, Chicago, and is currently an Associate Professor of Art and Design at North Central College, exploring personal history, cultural identity, gender politics, and craft traditions. Her work vary from videos to embroidery paintings, embellished when with vibrant colors, patterns, and autobiographical relics. Her work has been exhibited nationally at Expo Chicago, One After 909, Woman Made Gallery, South Bend Museum of Art, Conline Museum of Art, St. Louis Art Guild, and Queens College Art Center. Her videos have been screened internationally, including New York's 
City, Berlin, Warsaw, and Jerusalem. She was recently a Facebook Chicago artist in residence and, and completed residencies at uh, ACRE, Jaiwar, Barcelona, Momentum Worldwide Berlin, Elsewhere Museum, and the Chicago Artist Coalition. She, she will be a guest teaching artist at Textile Center, uh, our first guest teaching artist since the pandemic. So we are really, really thrilled to welcome uh, Halle for that. It will be July 7th through the 9th, and she will lead a workshop called Symbolic Memory, Mixed Media Textiles. Uh, it is uh, or will be this afternoon currently uh, open on Textile Center's website. So please check it out and help spread the word. Uh, Jocelyn, I am going to start the screen share. And if you would go ahead and share your screen, we're going to begin with Jocelyn Suzuka Figueroa. Okay, I think I'm unmuted. Um, I am having technical problems where my computer is just totally glitching out. But right now you're here. Um, I'm going to try to run on this momentum and hope that it works. Apologies. So um, share screen. So, so um, again, apologies if uh, prayers that this presentation works, but um, Hello, my name is Jocelyn Suzuka Figueroa. I would like to start by offering my thank yous to Tracy Crum, Ivan Yanez, and all of those at the Textile Center, to the other artists who are a part of Continuum, and of course, to all of you who made it here today to listen to us speak. Nami Nui literally translates to wave stitch. It is a simple, hand-sewn stitch that it punctures the fabric in a regular, repeating, syncopated beat up and down, through and through, like the repeating rhythm of waves crashing against a shore. It is essentially a running stitch and is the base fundamental stitch for most hand sewing. All the plush dolls seen here were sewn using it. I was taught to sew by my mother, who is Japanese. My father, on the other hand, is a white American. I am a hafu, half Japanese, half American, defined in fractions rather than a whole. My mom taught me Nami Nui, like her mother did before her, just like my grandmother learned from my great-grandmother. This is a stitch that has repeatedly passed from the hands of mothers to daughters in the regular, repeating rhythm of the waves, threading its way from Nara, Osaka, Kyoto, then the United States. It is with intention that I make my plush dolls using Nami Nui. I would like to show you the significance of plush dolls by telling you a story. I was born in Kyoto, and we moved to America when I was two years old. It, I brought with me a small stuffed black cat. It was my favorite thing, and it went everywhere with me. This would prove to be the black cat's undoing. A few years after we moved, I lost it while playing on a playground. My small child hands tore through the sand, but I could not find my cat. For almost eight years, I would return to that spot in the playground and dig in the sand. Searching, searching, searching for my cat. I finally gave up when the playground was remodeled. The sand churned up and replaced with turf. Strong machinery did the work that my small hands never could. Needless to say, I never found my little black cat, and this memory has always stuck with me. I think, in some way, the cat was a lasting memory of a home we used to inhabit, far, far away now. The cat was a reminder of Japan and of the family there and I lost it. Stuffed animals act as transitional objects for when small children learn to separate from the mother. But I wonder if the same also does apply from a transition from one land, the motherland, to another. I believe I never truly got over the separation from Japan to America. And in a way, the stuffed animals are a manifestation of this, attached to a moment of transition. The work I make is all rooted in this moment of divide, stuck in the transition from one country to the other, caught in that liminal space is a relation to family. For the vast majority of my life, I only experienced my family in Japan as voices on the phone, a phone that steadily grew quieter over the years until communication effectively ended. They no longer call or answer our calls. My mother's family resents the fact that we have left them and no longer considers us family. So ghosts are ever present in the work I create. 
They float on the periphery of life without a sense of time and unbound to the security of place and home. Whispers of these ghosts live in my plush toys, but they do not settle easily there because the dolls are meant to be squeezed, held, and loved. They are too heavily bound in tactile reality. Thus, the ghosts are banished to the realm of paintings, imaginary planes of space which are cold and untouchable. Scroll paintings which stand in mourning of a life that is now just a memory. Sometimes I try to defy that boundary drawn between here and there, then and now. These two plush toys are meant to represent my great-grandmother Kikwe and myself. People tell me that I look identical to her. And what I know about her is this. I know that she would sew. I know that she carefully maintained the traditions that she was raised to respect. For instance, repairing their household Buddhist altar with gold leaf. I know that my mother, just a child at the time, opened the window as my great-grandmother Kikwe died, her spirit being released into the open air. My mother hung out of that window, yelling for the world to return her spirit, which was a fruitless gesture. But in some way, I live for these fruitless gestures. Like my mother in the window, I am yelling into the air, calling for a return of something that can never realistically come. People tell me I look like my great-grandmother, so I have attached myself to this imagined connection. I look for her in myself. She passed in the 70s, but it is my hope that a small part of her lives on in me. Seen here are both of my great-grandparents, Kikwe and Satoru, represented in both a painting and as plush cat dolls. The painting is done on gold leaf, just like Kikwe would use for the Buddhist altar, and the dolls are sewn using the very Nami Nui stitch used by her hands. I created these dolls to ultimately give to Kikwe's daughter, my grandmother, Nobuko. She is currently in Japan and has shown signs of dementia as far back as 2012. The last I heard of her, she would sit in a dark room with the curtains drawn, watching television, sequestered from the world, as she was too inconvenient to those who took care of her. Floating in a dark liminal state where her mind was stuck in the past more than the present. We have not heard from her since 2017. I created these two dolls to send to her. It was my hope that they would give her some measure of comfort. In my mind, I imagine a satisfying reunion defying reality. I do know that this reunion is a fantasy, but regardless, I made the dolls. I have held on to them for over a year now, because the truth is that I am scared. I'm scared to confront the inevitable reality that I will be sending my dolls into the void. I do not know if my grandmother is even alive. Her family would not tell us if she passed. This was the case with my mother's father. So I don't know if she's even there to receive them. And I am scared to make this last step, but I know I must do it because I am the child that dug in the sand of a playground for eight years, daughter of the girl who screamed to the spirits through an open window, granddaughter of a woman who watches TV in the darkness, great-granddaughter of the woman who taught her child to sew using the Nami Nui stitch. We are all threaded together, one after another, bound by efforts of futility and messages into the void. And through these hands passes a thread, from the hands of mothers to daughters, hands that will never again touch. Thank you for listening to me speak today. Great, Claire, if you would go ahead and share your screen. All right, everything looks good. Okay. Hi, uh, my name is Claire Hu. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us today. I really appreciate it. And I'm really happy to be here and talk about my work a little bit. So uh, I'm currently based out of Brooklyn, but I'm originally from Georgia, specifically the Metro Atlanta we uh, area. I'm a weaver and artist who really loves to play with sculpture and installation. Uh, because the theme of this panel discussion is family and memory, I really wanted to include these two pictures of my parents before they immigrated to the States in the 80s. Their journey is really kind of the jumping off point for a lot of my work and kind of sits within the larger story of immigration and acclimation for a lot of Chinese Americans coming into the South. 
So right now, a good bit of my work and research really surrounds the cultural shifts that occurred in the metro Atlanta area around the 70s and 80s within the Chinese American communities that lived there. Because there was such a big influx of movement towards this area, there was definitely a need to find um, a place to congregate and to create community. And if anyone knows anything about Atlanta, it's very much a big sprawl of suburbs. Cultural centers uh, really became centered around strip malls. Um, and what you could call a Chinatown that grew out of this is very much in no way as condensed as the ones that you see in like New York or California. And these strip malls kind of contained everything that a new immigrant population would need. It would have your grocery stores, your CPA tax offices, your bookstores, your restaurants. So the image on the left is kind of a good depiction of where all of these um, strip malls kind of sat within the uh, metro Atlanta area. And kind of on the other side of my research, I've really been looking at and interrogating ideas of Southern nostalgia and ways that it's become codified and kind of mainstream now. For those that might not know, ideas of Southern nostalgia are very much rooted in kind of like an underdog and oppositional position that almost creates a mentality that the South or its ideas have always been disappearing and declining. And the outcome of that is obviously a very much big need to reassert and reenact these very much outdated ideals. So you can kind of see this hold on a lot of that historical memory through landscape, very much through the statues and the monuments it holds, the street names that cross from one another in the South. Um, it can also be seen in a lot of touristy kind of landmarks like Stone Mountain in Georgia, um, a site whose imagery and icons I really frequently use in my own work. Because there is a Confederate uh, memorial that sits on that site, Stone Mountain has historically been used to signify and reassert the power of white supremacy uh, within the government of Georgia, especially during the 50s and 60s when it was being constructed. And quite literally bridging, you know, this cluster of strip malls that I talk about a lot in my work and Stone Mountain is one highway that connects both of them. So the imagery that I use is very much taken from my own personal moments. They become, you know, the Chinese grocery stores and restaurants that my family and I frequented very regularly. They're just the textures and the imagery of a community and just a regular everyday life. Uh, but they do become coded images to kind of the audience that I want to talk to directly. A very good example of this is like the 99 Ranch Market. I feel like they're everywhere on the West Coast and in the Midwest maybe, um, but there was really only one one that existed at the time in Atlanta it had this very distinctive blue tiles that only one strip mall in the area kind of had. Um, and I think it closed down probably during the mid 2010s. So there's really this importance of pinpointing to these certain locations and times within a set amount of history. And I think what really drew me to talking about these strip malls is kind of, you know, my own fascination of this new immigrant population uh, using the architectural and tools that were already there in order to kind of acclimate and find community at that time. And I definitely find like a parallel when I'm, you know, working on the loom, uh, you're working with a set structure, but you're able to kind of subvert it to, to find your own needs within that. So this piece is kind of what really started this new body of work that's part of my current studio practice. Um, I am really drawn to the idea of making textiles that are therefore unusable once I take them off the loom. There's this kind of sense of entropy kind of already baked into it. Uh, growing up, my parents were also very much in like the renovation business. So I was around a lot of construction materials when I was younger and that's definitely fed into my uh, making later in life. I really see like the idea of construction or renovation as a metaphor for a transition or, you know, the in-between places between two different moments in time. So I became very interested in memorializing the tarp, which is, you know, one, a textile that you could find at a construction site. Um, something that is very much thrown to the side, but otherwise very important. For me, they became almost memorials to the kind of tricky kinds of assimilation and cultural slippages and understandings that happens uh, between immigrants, not necessarily just in the South, but everywhere. Uh, so I started utilizing these straps or harnesses that hold and hang the piece. They really uh, become a cradle and give more autonomy to the textile as well as weight. And here's just a newer example of that work echoing the same kind of structure as the first. You can kind of see a 
the harness peaked out on the left hand side um, of that work. And what I really just love about this system is the flexibility it inherently has. There's a lot of different ways that they can exist and interact in different spaces. They're able to kind of clip on to each other um, in different ways and really just like has this ability to respond. Uh, and then with these newer pieces, I've also just been thinking more about patches. There's definitely more of like an emphasis on patching and uh, more intentionality about the imagery and the textures I want to add, as well as like additions to these tarps. And with that, uh, with the tarps and in conjunction with making them, I've started creating these things. I like to call them perspective patches. Uh, first, they just became a necessary way in order to kind of fix these tarps once they're off the loom. Um, what is really, I think, delicate about a lot of fabric, handwoven fabric, is, you know, once you cut into it, it automatically damages it. There's this idea that it might keep deteriorating as time goes on. So I definitely first uh, came to these as kind of like a necessary approach, but then became making them as a way to create patches for unmaterialized textiles, um, which I think might seem very pessimistic, kind of points to this idea that, you know, you're always waiting for the worst to happen. But I definitely see them more as like this guarded, optimistic practice that really helps conserve my own experiences and personal memories. Maybe if I am prepared enough and the worst won't happen, but in actual, like, in actual utilization, these will probably be used to seam and patch the larger tarps in the future. Um, I've also just been really interested in how these ideas of the South are very much manifested in material culture, specifically a lot of weave drafts. Uh, recently, I've been working more with distorted overshot weaves. Um, overshot weaving was uh, very popular in the Appalachian region as well as, the, as well as Georgia, and being able to kind of distort that on and off the loom. Uh, with these newer patches, I've also been playing with, you know, different opacity with the fabric choices to layer, and um, with these definitely using a lot of screen print tests and off-cut weavings to collage together. Uh, I've always been very interested in, like, the dynamic of hiding and covering different parts of the textile as as a way of like hiding information as well and um, cutting away and overall it's just been very gratifying to kind of bounce back between both forms of making on and off the loom working in kind of this slow and fast craft at the same time so by exploring both sides of these histories uh this permeable curtain or tarp as you as you could say i really try to convey how these two narratives coincide with each other how they coexist and how my personal narrative can inform and alter the other um, for me it's really important to kind of rethink the spaces that we pass through these spaces that hold and represent very vastly different ideas that are situated so close to um to each other and really create an opening for a larger dialogue that brings, you know, the problems and the issues of the South to the forefront while honoring like the ways that we got here as well. Thank you, Claire. Uh, Halle, if you're ready for your screen share, it's set to go. Hi, yes, one sec. Okay, hi, can, you can hear me, right? Um, I'm Hale Ikinji. As, um, thank you, Tracy, for the introduction and having me for this talk. Um, I, for time's sake, I have many slides and I will not be going through all of them for, probably, but I uh, want to start with just a brief overview of what I am showing currently at the Textile Center. I'm um, showing a um, few embroidered paintings um, that are based uh, on photographs from my family uh, and I'm from Turkey, I'm an immigrant. Um, I came to the States for um, college and ended up staying and I got, uh, I recently got married to an American uh, from Indiana and I'd like to uh, joke that it's the crossroads of America and I've been um, interested in what uh, family is and how our histories informs um, the ideas of home and um, how um, the immigrant identity and um, gendered labor um, factors into 
um, the phases of acculturation for um, um, immigrant in the States. And a lot of my work um, starts from photographs that, as I mentioned, from my family, but also from my husband's family. And I obscure the identities of the people in these photographs to um, both make it more anonymous and less autobiographical, but also to mix um, and confuse the identities of people. So in a way, um, these people that are from different parts of the world um, can be seen on a similar um, playing field. And um, these are two works um, that I made on the left. It's an embroidered painting and on the right, it's a um, work on paper um, that's uh, mainly composed of photo transfers and acrylic. And both of them are um, edged with Oya, which I will get to in a minute, but I wanted to share, uh, similar to Claire, I wanted to share this um, image that these images of myself on the left wearing a fake <laughs> folk dancing outfit in Turkey and then on the right of my mother who's um, wearing a dress that actually has some kilim symbols. And um, some of the um, ideas that I think about as I make my work are phases of acculturation, craft traditions, um, women's work, identity, immigration, um, Middle Eastern culture and the use of ornamentation um, and um, communication as well. Um, and I, a lot of my research revolves around these craft traditions and uh, what they were used for. And a lot of them are done by women. Um, something I think about is the relative um, importance given to craft versus art and how it tends to be um, the things that are made by women that are often undervalued. And one of one such thing is this um, technique called Oya on the left side. You can see these crochet edgings on headscarves, uh, which would typically be the only form of embellishment a Muslim woman would wear. And it's also not just embellishment, but functional as well, not to only to cover their um, heads and be pious, but also to um, protect them. My mom wears it when she fries food and things like that. So it's a very um, common part of their life. Um, but traditionally, um, so I apply these in my work and um, it particularly interests me because traditionally women used to use these to communicate um, certain feelings that they were not allowed to share openly. Another research, um, a topic of research that I uh, find interesting is other forms of um, symbolic meaning and forms of communication that you find in kilim rugs that are mostly woven by women. These are some um, uh, sort of a dictionary I made for myself. Uh, on some what some of these symbols mean and communicate and women would um, put these into their work and I mimic this methodology in my work as well and other forms of Islamic ornamentation. Um, here is some more Islamic ornamentation and here are some uh, women artists that um, are working on these techniques that uh, inspire me a lot. And um, in terms of my materials and process, which is also very important uh, for me in my work, um, is a mixed media, as Tracy mentioned, I will be giving a workshop on some of my methodology and my process. I start with trans um, editing, digitally editing imagery and uh, transferring them onto these textiles. Most of them are bed sheets or domestic textiles that have been touched. Uh, by people and are again associated mostly with um, 
home and women. Um, then I paint and embroider over them. Sometimes I use other transfer techniques and sometimes I quilt them and um, they end up with crochet on the edges. And here's some process shots. I get asked a lot about my process and it's an important aspect in my works. I included some process shots. This is how I transfer the imagery and I paint over them. And um, this is a shot from a large scale version of this that I did for Facebook's office in Chicago that was a 25 feet by 16 feet. Um, I sometimes use block printing for the patterns. Um, again, sometimes I um, use Photoshop to sketch out ideas before I commit to um, the work on textiles. And this is sort of a before and after shot. Um, the Oya, I used to harden the Oya. I'm not doing that anymore. I'm, I embrace the, uh, what the textile wants to do more uh, instead of trying to um, make it more rigid. And um, here are some studio shots that since you can't be uh, visiting our studios virtually, I wanted to bring a little bit of a view of it into here and this is another um, work that's currently in this exhibition um, and some detailed shots of it. Um, lately, I've started to break the typical painting rectangle um, that's a very much Western uh, canon into more uh, fluid forms and shapes um, in, like these that are more informed by using scraps of textiles or um, fashion um, pattern influences and using some um, sort of bodily gestures like pleating and quilting, et cetera. And um, that is the end of my presentation and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much, Olfi. And now I'm study, studying at MCAT. Next, please. Um, as... Next, please. Oh, yeah. It's, it's yeah. Don't worry. Um, well, uh, when I studied uh, first fashion design, I started working with volumetric uh, pieces of garments. Uh, most of them were experimental with paper. Uh, next, please. Then, yeah, well, then when I moved here um, many years ago as well, uh, one of my favorite practices were illustration and watercolor. So I start working with watercolor um, with the saturation of uh, elements and also these textures to represent uh, to represent one of the things that is more important for me and my homeland in Mexico, incorporating all these flowers, textures, and uh, taking this palette color using pink, uh, culturally pink in Mexico represents something very important. And also I think is the color of the city. Um, next, please. Uh, working with these illustrations, I just realized that doing these characters that were like half animal, half human, was also something that reminds me to my homeland in Mexico. Uh, we have these uh, these mythical animals that are called, we call alebrijes. If you don't know what is alebrijes, basically a combination between many animals to make one mythical character. Uh, so I start doing my, my own combination between all these different humanism, animal um, paintings. Next, please. Um, so all my 
process has been like more um, immersive to make all my illustrations. This is an installation that I made um, to represent all these tarot cards that I made by myself with my own imagery. Uh, everything is related with dreams. Also, I have this connection with dreams. I think um, Mexico City has a huge community of people thinking and talking about dream, uh, about dreams. And for me to make this connection every morning, uh, talking about my dreams and doing the situation of ideas with my mom is something that keep, keeps me connected with her. So I was trying to represent all these dreams related with tarot cards in all these animations that I made uh, projected on this on these pieces of fabric. Next, please. Then uh, I was more curious to work with my uh, with uh, with more volume again and with fabrics, and I start working with these soft sculptures, uh, taking some elements that reminds me to my homeland Mexico City uh, as some plants, also some elements from my dreams, and also. Uh, common dreams that most people have, like the, these falling uh, molars and also these oil clothes that are very typical and uh, well known in all the restaurants uh, in the street in, in Mexico. Uh, so having taken all these textures and also, next please, <clears throat> working with uh, with some representations of my spine um, because I, I'm i doing this relation between my family and my spine and my bones. Uh, this is also another installation who represents different parts of the present, future and past. So this skeleton is basically my spine and I was representing my family as a spine uh, is something that all we have like bones is uh, are always growing with you and go with you uh, all the time. And this piece is called Awake. I have been working with this reflected material to give the, the, um, the viewer a different experience to have this relation as a mirror. Next, please. And this is my last, uh, my most recently piece, uh, mixing everything, all, all these materials that I have been working before and connecting with these textures, connecting with this, uh, this piece is inspired in my family, but also is inspired in the Mexican lottery that I have been doing a long research about um, this uh, relation between tarot and also I found in all my research that is exists uh, Aztec tarot. So when I realized and I start studying these uh, cards and these relations, I discovered that also um, many people in Mexico use uh, the lottery cards to predict future. So I was super curious to explore more with this theme. So I started inc incorporating more, uh, more, more elements from the lottery, from the Mexican lottery. And also in this installation, I incorporated some pictures from my family at spe specifically moments when they moved um, from my family is originally from Tapachula, Chiapas. Uh, is in the south of Mexico. Um, Mexico City is a place that keeps people uh, from different places. So everything is a beautiful mix of colors, saturations, nature, and also different accents. Um, we all speak Spanish, but with different accents. So I consider myself as, as 
this beautiful combination of everything. And also all my work is connected with that, um, with that, with that personality. Mm. And next, please. These are some ceramics that I have been working also recently uh, with the same um, colorful imagery that uh, inspires me from the nature from my homeland. And that's all. I'm going to go ahead and just let Yvonne yeah. uh, begin the conversation with the artist presenters. Oh, absolutely, yes. Um, well, thank you very much. Uh, all of these, um, all of these presentations has been like very special, uh, specifically because we all have in common this inspiration between family and this is related with memory. And one of the elements that resonate with me was when I was watching all your pieces was this relationship between the materials and techniques that and all the stories from the family archival. So I wonder, um, for example, if we are all coming from different places, how you make this relation in how to keep traditions far away from home. I don't know if you want to jump with this question, if you have something in mind. Um, if I can answer, um, in my view, I feel that it has to, um, it really needs to be an intentional effort. Like if this, if you're trying to maintain connection from something that's so, so distant, it, it needs to be something that, at least with me, I felt that I needed to make the active effort to reclaim. And because I grew up here in a small town, Minnesota and very white town, I needed to be intentional with my efforts to reconnect and reclaim. So it's not something that necessarily for me passively happened. I had to make the intention. Nice, yeah, that's true. I was thinking also, um, for example, that embroidery and all of these techniques is something that we know since we are a child, I have this connection. And also I remember the moment when I start learning how to embroider with my grandma. And I think it's the story of many families. So this is something very uh, important for me because I mean, as artists, we, we don't turn, uh, we don't turn to see all the importance of this crafty. And for example, Helly, do you think um, do you think there is a connection between handwork and memory? I was curious to ask you this. Yes, thank you. Um, I would like to speak to the first question you asked too, um, if that's okay. I two things. One, I actually was not trained in textiles. My, um, both my undergrad and graduate work, my graduate work was in video, <laughs> but I found myself um, going back to textiles as a comfort and almost like personal therapy. And I realized, why don't I use this in my work? And I took an embroidery workshop in acre at an artist residency and I realized oh I know this already somehow and I always like to think about it as osmosis from just being surrounded by these women crafters um, growing up um, and that's how I started to incorporate it into my work so I think in a way by just using these techniques that are so familiar to me and are in my DNA it makes me feel more connected to my heritage, my homeland, um, and these women. Um, 
And then another aspect is, uh, as I started doing more research into Oya, the lace edgings and how women would use it to communicate their feelings where they weren't necessarily allowed to speak their mind in the context of their extended families. Um, I found that very inspirational and Again, as a non-native English speaker, having to communicate all the time in a language and in a world where words and language has so much more um, importance, um, I like the idea of using these visual patterns as a way of communication and where only some people can understand and others are not <laughs> included. <laughs> and um, that how women would do that so um there's like so many aspects of it that and i like bringing it into a fine art setting as a frame um so yeah lots of um things that i think about as i work borrow these techniques yeah, talking about this uh, language of symbols, I think this, this is very important also because um, when I was uh, first also, you say something very important uh, with this connection of the, um, uh, this peace moment when you feel secure working with these materials. Uh, when I was doing my presentation, I realized that I wanted to incorporate this first image uh, of my volumetric paper dress um, because I realized that it's important also on, or, or also was important for me at the moment when I realized after illustration that I wanted to go again to the moment that I was feeling more safe. And also I think working with the hand and I mean, when you are painting and illustrating, you are also working with the hands, but more like I, I refer this like and doing this interaction, I think there is some details on the artist. Um, so, I don't know, I wanted to ask also Jocelyn, uh, talking about uh, this legacy that you, and also is very connected with the thing uh, about the techniques. Um, how do you connect, how do you incorporate your nostalgia in your pieces? Um, nostalgia appears in many ways because nostalgia is really a longing for the past, correct? And past connections. Um, in my case, sometimes some things that are just purely imagined nostalgia, <laughs> not necessarily my reality, but um, there it's incorporated through the very nature of what stuffed animals are, what plush dolls are, um, the look of them. They they're the they look like the characters of childhood. Um, just there's callbacks to Japan and Japanese culture within them. They're kawaii. They have um, big round eyes that uh, look into you and just call you to hold and touch. They it's nostalgia appears in that tactile sense in in the childlike imagery and kind of in that suspension in that moment of transition from when I was two years old and I came to America, just that moment, which I don't think I ever fully transitioned out of. So it's it's a suspension in nostalgia, really, if that makes sense. Question. I'm gonna make a contribution from the audience. Um, thank you, Alonso, for your question for Claire, because I think it's related at this time. Um, Alonso asks, loved how you talked about construction as a metaphor for transition. So talking about transition, using the straps or tarp material that speaks to that in-betweenness. Could you talk about the relationship 
of weaving as this act of gathering both formally and conceptually. And I personally want to add sort of a side question to that, and that is that you're currently living in Brooklyn. And so I'm curious if the the impetus or the content, I don't know what, how you want to say it, of your work is um, has any, if you feel any shifts going on, um, no longer living in the South. So that's kind of a two, two loaded questions maybe at once, but let's see what we come up with. Yeah, thank you so much for the question, Alonzo. Um, I come to weaving, I think, in a very chaotic way. And I think that kind of talks a little bit about that in-betweenness or transition. Um, I think for anyone that has ever like planned any weaving, it takes so much time and care in order to dress the loom, make sure that there aren't any mistakes. Uh, but for me, I really love to be able to kind of push that idea of weaving to the extreme so like really pushing the loom to the extreme as well and creating these like haptic skips and jumps and then once taken off the loom really cut back into and collage um, and I think that really just comes from like this idea of wanting to reclaim a history. Uh, my parents moved here from the States and I grew up in the States not really knowing a lot about my history and family back in China. So this idea of like this transition or like memorializing construction is really for myself, like honoring the search for information, for more research, especially in Georgia. Um, there's been like such a long history of Chinese Americans who've moved into the South um, as laborers before the Civil War that, you know, a lot of people don't know their names, what they did, but there is kind of like these like imprints in time. Uh, and for me, I also see that within like this large uh, movement of like gentrification and construction that's also happening in a lot of these strip malls and places in the states that I'm talking about right now. So I, I think like that just chaos comes from just like wanting to create something, but then like ripping it down and making it for for myself. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, do you, uh... We probably have time for one or two more questions. I know we're bumping up right against one, but um, if f folks have other things they want to say, I think we have time. Okay, perfect. Um, yeah, I one of my other my other questions was uh, how has been or how do you think is your role as an artist? into this new society. Can you, can you hear me? Yeah, it's a really big question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I know, I think for myself, it's just really important, uh, like this Chinese American, in, like community that I talk about is very small in Georgia, but um, a lot of the histories only passed through a lot of oral stories and family and community. Not a lot of things are written down. And I just think it's very important to, you know, kind of give light to the South as not just being a monolith of history that's very rooted within like the Civil War and, you know, all this like ideas of Southern nostalgia that there are other um, communities and populations that kind of push back against that, which I think is, you know, very important to now. <laughs> Yeah, I also think there is a huge connection and also um, talking about uh, this handwork, I think it builds a community um, since we learn how to make this. And also I have talked with many uh, peers and they are all connected like when they have a question about uh, embroidery or the sewing machine, they also call their moms. And I think that is something amazing. Um, I think it's very connected just to make also a community as well. And also one of my goals as an artist, I would like to share with the world that there are like, some feelings that are common and it's not from different or especially from each culture 
I think all as humans have been connected through these uh, imagery, feelings, colors, and also that is one of the things that I that resonates more with me with this thing of the tarot cards. Um, I uh, I was able to to put names when I was working on this project, and uh, uh, I remember my mentor told me, "Why don't you uh, write the name in Spanish?" And I was like, ah, "What I don't write the name in English," and then I just say, "Why I just." give the the viewer this experience without any kind of names because all they can figure it out what is in the tarot card so i think this is like sometimes the language of the texture or sometimes the language of the imagery or the color or the feeling of the color is something that also brings some kind of language to the viewer and i think that is something that um resonates more with me. Uh, and I don't know if you have something to add, Tracy. I do not, but I want to ask if Holly or Jocelyn has um, anything else to say before we wrap up, because I think we're, we're at a little bit after one and out of respect for the audience and the presenters. Um, yeah. Do either of you want to make a final contribution? I just want to thank you to everyone that showed up today and cared about what we had to say. Um, and that I look forward to the workshop in a, a few weeks. Thank you. And I just want to say that uh, as far as that last question goes, I feel it is our responsibility as artists to maintain these practices that we have learned through our family, through the generations and maintain them and for ourselves for the future because they were given to us from the past. And I think um, it's a valuable thing to be able to bring into the present. So that's, that's my finishing note. <laughs> I just want to thank everybody for coming. Um, we will be doing one more of these Continuum Art Speaks panel conversations in about two weeks towards the end of June. And thank you so much. Everybody have a great afternoon. And um, this will wrap up our first Art Speaks of 2022. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>